Um, my name is Brian Arizumi. I'm the Public Safety Officer for the City of Temple City. And tonight we'll be going over Section 5 of the Citizens Academy. Uh, let's play it safe. It's about public safety. Tonight with us we also have Captain Nee of the station here. And I'm going to say a few words. Welcome. Welcome to Temple Station. You're in Sheriff Station. Uh, everybody here a resident of Temple City? Yes. yes. Oh, beautiful. Uh, well, my name's Chris Renee. I've been the captain here signed since October 15th of last year. And I've had the honor of uh, being for all intents purposes here, police chief, as well as we serve the cities of Bradbury, Morgan, Roseby, South Almonte, the unincorporated areas of Almonte, South San Gabriel, North Island. East Pasadena, and then the Arcadia, and Northern Board, and we'll be further than that. Uh, <coughs> so we service a lot of other communities besides Temple City, but none more important than Temple City. It's uh, one of the most important contracts, and uh, our station is housed here in Temple City. Which we're very happy to do so. Uh, so I just want to welcome you, and uh, if you want to read off, I'll... Uh, tonight, again, we're going to be talking about public safety, and... What is public safety? Public safety is the prevention and protection from events mm -hmm. that can endanger the safety and well-being of the general public. And so when we look at public safety, there's two components of it. It's a protection component and a prevention component. Um, protection, we want to protect our residents. Does everybody have the hand up? Okay. Uh, we want to protect our residents, our businesses and business owners. And we want to protect and maintain a quality of Sorry, I can't hear you. Before we get started, do we need any more seats? Do we have any more seats coming? We know, or I'm not sure we had a count of the Jerry has a sign sheet. I think it's pretty much better. Okay. We can try to see if we get some more tables. If anyone needs tables in the back, are you okay? In the back, everybody okay with that table? Yeah. Okay, we're going to back here. Okay, so we were saying protection, we want to protect our residents, protect our business owners, our business community, and we want to protect and maintain the quality of life that we all expect in Temple City, which is a high quality of life. Uh, prevention, again, we want to look at preventing crime to maintain that quality of life, and also preventing disasters, emergencies from occurring. There are some that we can prevent uh, man-made disasters and do what we can to mitigate um, the disasters from affecting Temple City. Uh, but again, there are some that we cannot control, such as the wind storms or earthquakes, but we can do our part to prepare for that. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about law enforcement, fire department, and emergency preparedness. Uh, for law enforcement, we're going to cover why do we contract with Temple Station and the Sheriff's Department? What are the crime trends in Temple City? Are there regional issues affecting Temple City uh, that are outside of our physical boundaries of the city? And what is the city doing to enhance our services with the Sheriff's Department? Why do we contract with the Sheriff's Department? Temple City is a 100% contract city. That means we do not have our own police department, our own fire department, or our own public works department. And so we contract those services with the Sheriff's Department for law enforcement services. Uh, one of the benefits in contracting with the Sheriff's Department is that it is less expensive than maintaining your own police department. It's about 60% less than maintaining a, a full service police department. Where at Temple City, we have about a $3 million budget for law enforcement services. In a city comparable size to Temple City, it may be about an $8, $9 million budget for those law enforcement services. Our current contract with the Sheriff's Department expires in 2014. Um, at that time, we'll, we'll look at other avenues and look at other resources that we have available to Temple City. Um, the contract with the Sheriff's Department does have its benefits, though. It does avail us other resources that would not be otherwise um, available to Temple City if we had our own police department. And we'll go into that a little bit later. Um, it provides greater flexibility of staffing levels. As a uh, police department and city staff, you have limited staffing levels. You cannot just bring someone in from another station or another agency. Where the sheriff's department, it is flexible. So if we have a need or if we have an increase in crime and we want to um, have more enforcement in an area, we can ask the sheriff's department to bring in additional resources. And so that flexibility of that manpower um, can grow or decrease as needed. Um, 
Uh, Temple Station is located in Temple City, so that is definitely a benefit. Uh, we do have the station in our city. Um, other cities that they contract, as Captain E said, City of Rosemead, City of South Amati, City of Dewari, and City of Bradbury don't have a station in the city. So we have that as a major benefit to us. Um, the 227 rule, uh, this is if you have your own police department. For every two miles and a two minute response, it costs the city $7 million to maintain that police department. And so again, the cost benefit to contracting with the sheriff's department goes without saying. Uh, the current deployment levels in Temple City, uh, we have three shifts. There are the day shift, the night shift, or the PM shift, and the early morning shift. On the day shift, we have three cars uh, deployed in the city, two crime cars and one traffic car. Uh, the night shift, we have, again, three cars, uh, two crime cars again, and a traffic car. And on the early morning shift, we have two units, one crime car and one traffic car. During any of the, uh, sh those shifts, the services and manpower in the city can be raised based on having our special assignment team. Uh, Temple City has a three deputy and a sergeant special assignment team that are dedicated to just Temple City. We also have a motorcycle enforcement deputy that is dedicated to Temple City. And so those basic level um, patrol levels do not reflect the other resources that we have available. In addition to the staffing levels that we have there, if an emergency does occur or if we have a burglary in progress or a crime in progress now that we need additional resources, we can pull those resources from the city of Rosemead, from the city of South Amani, from the city of Dewarty and Bradbury and the county areas that Temple Station provides service to. If this becomes a larger incident, bigger than what the station level can handle, we can go out and also pull resources from nearby sheriff stations from La Puente Pico Rivera Station, from Industry Station, from even Malibu and Lancaster if we need to, which was done during the windstorm. Um, Captain E was able to get units from other areas to provide us additional resources during the windstorm event to ensure the safety of the public uh, in Temple City. Um, some of the specialized units, as I discussed, that we have available to Temple City that uh, it would be very expensive for a city to maintain for its own police department are such as the Major Crimes Bureau, the Asian Crime Task Force, the Special Enforcement Bureau, which is the SWAT team, the Narcotics Bureau, uh, Aero Bureau, which is the helicopters, uh, Arson Explosives Detail, or also known as the Bomb Squad, uh, Special Victims Bureau, and an Auto Theft Task Force. Uh, these are just some of the other specialized units that are available. There are a lot more, uh, too many to list on one slide, but additional information is available on the Sheriff's Department's website. In addition, um, to the specialized units, the station and the city and the city staff conduct special operations. Uh, we do DUI checkpoints, probation and parole operations, ensuring that anybody that's uh, released on probation or parole are in compliance. Uh, burglary suppression operations, we have units out if we have high crime area in a certain neighborhood and we have an increase in burglaries, we'll saturate that neighborhood uh, and stop anybody and look for anybody that doesn't look like they fit there, contact them and maybe arrest them if they are in act of committing crime or get their information. Directed traffic enforcement, transient operations. Uh, we have some transit problems in the city once in a while, and so the Sheriff's Department in the city will go out and sweep the streets and make contact with any transits in there, making sure they're in compliance with all our city rules and regulations. Uh, pedestrian crosswalk operation. This is an operation where we have a deputy in plain clothes crossing an intersection at an unmarked intersection and making sure that vehicles that are traveling on that street yield to that pedestrian. Uh, failure to yield will result in a citation and this is uh, quite an extensive operation. Uh, we also do auto theft operations, bicycle theft operations, due diligence operations. That is, if anybody has a warrant, they're going to go out and make sure that they can find uh, anybody that has those warrants and do their diligence to arrest that person and bring them in uh, based on that warrant. And then saturation patrol operations. That's similar to the burglary operations, uh, where the burglary suppression may target one specific neighborhood. The saturation is you're going to saturate the whole city with maybe 15 sheriff units out in the city um, so that your presence is seen. Um, we have right here part one crimes and part two crimes. Um, as it says, our part one crimes are down and part two crimes are up. 
Uh, I'll have Captain E go into a little bit more about what part one crimes are and part two crimes are, and why we see this trend that our part one crimes are down and our part two crimes are up. Good, good evening. Um, I'd really like to commend everybody in this room, first and foremost, for taking time. I know you're not, this is not primarily law enforcement academy that you're attending. As a six week academy that you guys put up? Six, seven. Seven mm -hmm. Yeah, it just shows your commitment to the city of Temple City as citizens to learn the whole aspect of the city and help make it a better city. You know, not only law enforcement, but the way the code enforcement works, the way city government works. So I thank you for that. And really, it's an opportunity for us tonight to reach out. We put on a six week academy and Please, anyone in this room that's interested, please contact us at the end of the night. We'd love to have you. We were, uh, to be honest with you, quite honestly, we had a hard time trying to recruit people into the six week law enforcement academy that we put on. And basically, what it does is not to brainwash anybody, it's just to open up our doors and an opportunity for us to reach out to the community and show you our tactics. A lot of our tactics are different, they're, 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 a lot of the public don't understand. Uh, it's not a you know, why we're pulling people out, why we're putting them on the ground, pointing them down. It's tactics we've come up with throughout the years, not only our agency, but many agencies from around the country, to do our job safe. And so it's just a way for us to reach out to the community, show you how we do our job and why we do our job. And it's really important for us to establish a relationship with the community. We're here to make sure the community is safe. And we're supposed to drive down the street. We want people to look and see a deputy sheriff car driving by feel a sense of comfort, not fear. Do we ever want the crooks to fear us? Absolutely. If you're up to no good, I do want you to get nervous. I do want you to begin to sweat. But if you're a good citizen out there taking a walk, walking with your family, going to the store, raking your leaves in the front yard, I want you to get a sense of comfort as you see a car coming down the street. And know that you're in a safe neighborhood, that you can leave your windows open if you're night, at night if you need to, you get a nice cool breeze. You should be, you're entitled to that. You work quite hard all day long, you should be able to come home, enjoy the safety of your house, enjoy the safety of your front yard, having a barbecue, and not having to worry about some criminal coming by you, taking something from you, or trying to assault you, or shoot off a gun in some crazy manner. So, we appreciate you uh, partaking in this academy, and we encourage you to join and partake in our academy the next time you put it on. Uh, part one crimes, to get on with this here, we uh, identify serious crimes as part one crimes, and we categorize those homicides, rapes, robberies, uh, aggravated assaults, and that's kind of a, a mis uh, collection of different category crimes. Uh, aggravated assaults could be anywhere from a domestic violent assault where a husband and wife get into a physical altercation, or it can be a physical assault by a stranger on the street with a bat or a gun or something like that. So there's a couple of different categories that go into uh, aggravated assaults. Burglaries, again, burglary, our burglary statistic shows uh, both commercial burglaries and residentials. Uh, our larceny is another category of part one crime, and they can actually include anything from shoplifting, going into a store as a shoplifter, stealing a bicycle out of the front yard, and it also includes vehicle burglaries, where people go in either a locked car, which is just a, a theft, it's not a burglary, if the car's locked, we classify that as a burglary, but it goes underneath the, la the larceny category. And then we have a stolen vehicle as a category, and then finally arson. Those are the uh, crimes that make up what we consider our part one crimes or serious crimes. Uh, throughout the 2012, from January 1st to present, uh, we've had no homicides here in the city of Temple City. Uh, we've had one reported rape. Like it wasn't a stranger rape, it was a rape where the suspect was known at the time of the floor. Uh, so, based upon our statistics from last year, at this time we had two, so we're down 50% in that category. Kind of homicides, we had no homicides last year either, so it was a 0% change. Uh, robberies, we have four reported robberies in the uh, city so far this year, and we're at 67% on that. That decreased to 67% from last year. Uh, Aggravated assaults, we have 10, which is a decrease of 33% from last year. And again, aggravated assaults also, in that category, including domestic violent assaults as well. So some of those aren't necessarily just a stranger walking out there. It's a husband and wife getting into some kind of physical altercation or some type of domestic partners. 
Uh, burglaries, we're at 67 burglaries. That's residential and commercial burglaries. And that is a concern for us here in the city. About 8% from last year. Um, and I want to expand <coughs> upon the burglaries there. Uh, we have a big trend now. Most of our burglaries are residential, primarily. Um, and they're occurring during the days. You know, the, the day of people are at work. The majority of our citizens here in Tampa City go to work every day. And there's a generation of crooks that have come up now. And they've become so, crooks are sophisticated. We have gang groups of organized gangs from throughout the county. Primarily, it was started out, the trend started a few years ago where gangs from South Central A were doing it. But it's turned into such a profitable and successful career venture for them. It spread out amongst many gangs uh, throughout LA County. Black gangs, Hispanic gangs, white gangs, you know, mixed, all kinds of groups are getting involved in now. But what generally has happened, the pattern that we're seeing is uh, you'll have a group of people canvassing the neighborhood, knocking door to door. If nobody answers, they'll go around back, and they'll kick in the back door, they'll break in the window. And they have all day to, to, to rummage through that house. The car that dropped them off, We'll not stay in the area, we'll drive off. Crooks have cell phones now. So you have two or three suspects inside the house just going through the primary looking for cash, jewelry, flat screen TVs, easily removable or draw laptops, you know, stuff that's really easy to, to move and really easy to pawn. And then they'll gather all up, they'll be right inside the front door, they'll call up their driver. The driver can be a mile away. So not to draw attention to neighbors, drive up in the driveway, they'll run out, load up, and they're gone. And that's not unique to Temple City. We're seeing that to load out of the county. We work with all the different law enforcement agencies. We have a subsistence task force in the sheriff's department so they're following gangs around, monitoring them and watching. So it is common. We have a local hero in our class here tonight that participated in helping us. And the best thing we can do and that's Ms. Chavez, Ms. Chavez here. Let me recognize you for your great efforts. And what she did is exactly what I'm about to preach to do. And we, we have zone watches, and we'll get to that later tonight. And we preach this every time we have a zone watch. Um, during the day, she observed something that was unusual in the neighborhood. Saw some individuals walking in the neighborhood she never saw before. They went up to a neighbor's house. Knew the, neighborhood, the neighbor was off at work. Another neighbor apparently called and said, hey, do you have some workers coming over? No, there should be nobody in my house. They in turn called us. We drove over and set up a containment. Suspects started running. They pointed out, hey, they're running here. Suspects oftentimes wear multiple layers of clothing. If I'm wearing a black sweatshirt, I throw it off. Now I have a red shirt on. Now I'm running. Hey, I'm looking for a guy with a black shirt. Now you have so they're, they're sophisticated. <laughs> they are. They'll strip. They'll wear multiple layers of clothing. We'll strip it off and hope so. No, but we had Mrs. Chavez and we had another individual that took the time to call. We saw something was suspicious. Didn't look right. You know, and it may very well be that those guys were workers. They were there for legitimate reasons. We do have a lot of people around solicit those for us. Please call us. We would rather go out there and find it to be a big knuckle and the person had a legitimate reason to be there. And we can say, okay, thank you very much, and we're on our way. No harm to follow. Hey, we're out there to provide you a service. That's our job to go out there and make sure. We'd rather prevent crime than go and take a report. If I can stop crime from happening and you're not a victim, then I've done my job well. You know. So, long story short, this one, we got there, they started running and peeling off clothes and they were ID and we ended up catching three and we did field shows and they identified she and the other gentleman identified as a suspect. And we had three suspects in custody and we retrieved all his property from his house. Because two citizens did care, they did get involved. Now we're not asking you to go and confront anybody. Please don't get me confused. We, we don't want you to get confront anyone. That's our job. We're trained to do that. I have a gun, I have a vest, I have a radio, I have partners. You're out there and it's dangerous enough when we do it. Please do not. All we ask is to pick up a phone call. And it may be nothing, or it may be three suspects that we have in jail now. They've burglarized many more homes than this one before they came along. So that is a trend we're seeing. Another trend that we're seeing is distraction burglaries. And believe me, it, it's a, unbelievable how bold some people are. It, it, it baffles my mind. 24 years in law enforcement, and I still shake my head and go, how can anyone have the audacity to do that? But what we're seeing now, 
is a, a group of individuals are going out and they're targeting older folks primarily, and they're knocking on the door and they're putting on a reflective vest or they put on some type of work shirt with a name on it, or some of them may even have connections to utility companies such as the gas company or Southern California Edison and they're program that year and knock on the door and say, I need to come in and check your circuit breaker, I need to check your plumbing, I need to check your water pressure. And older folk, they look legitimate. And you know and a lot of times old folks can't believe how I'm dumb there. They, they say, oh, I'm so dumb, I can't believe it. It's no, no reflection on their intelligence. This just people take advantage of people that are trusting. We're, generally, we're trusting people. And unfortunately, you have to be a little skeptical this day and age. They'll go in, one the guy will walk with the person right to the kitchen, check the water, check the electrical panel, whatever it may be that they're asking to get in for. While that's happening, within seconds of them turning around and leaving that front door, the other suspect's sneaking in, right on, right almost right behind them. And going down the hallway, going through, and just ransacking what they can. And many times, the victim the guy was okay, water's great, thank you very much, and they'll leave. And the person's grateful, wow, the water company came out unannounced and checked my water pressure. What a nice gentleman. Well, it may not be, maybe another hour before they make it down the hall back to the bedroom, they see the bedroom's ransacked, the property's missing. Sometimes people, you know, they'll find out for a day or so, we get a call a week later, hey, you know what, this happened on this date, it might have been taken there. And the, how many times people don't even know they've been victimized, that we never get a report on. I'm sure the situation where that's happened. So be very careful with that. A utility company will not come to your house unannounced, generally, unless it's some type of emergency, a wind storm or a water main broke in the street. So you should be you should be skeptical of that right away. Always, always ask for identification. And please, if you feel any doubt, and if you do, call us. We'll come out, we'll check your area, we'll identify who they are. And we'll check their uh, their story to make sure they are part of the utility company. And I would much rather do that. That's our job. Like I said, you're not making us do any extra work. We're out there to work for you. And we'd much rather do that and catch the person over and prove that they are a legitimate utility company than to come and take a report and to see you feel terrible because you lost some kind of family. Or worse, yes, one of these guys got in and did something worse and assaulted somebody. So please. Pass, when the information we give you tonight, please pass it on to your neighbors. Many of you probably have elderly neighbors. Please talk to them and let them know. And please tell them, call the Sheriff's Department. We want to get up there. We want to be able to get in front of the crime and uh, have to come and take the report afterwards. And we do a good job of tracking these guys down. We had a case where we, when Brian uh, spoke earlier about parole provided checks. And uh, what we do, we have a team here of dedicated deputies, and we do target parolees and people on probation. And more specifically, since we've had this recent rise in burglaries, we target folks that are on probation for burglary. I'll tell you that right now, absolutely. If you're a parolee or a probationer and you're released in the Temple City or Temple Stations area, we're going to come visit you because law says we can. And you know what? We're encouraging them to, to do well in life. When we visit them, we also hand off pamphlets on how to get programs that we put on and the other agencies that you know, San Gabriel Valley put on that will show people how to turn their lives around. Job interview skills. You know, there's a program here in uh, Duarte with the YMCA. They'll take these probationers, we'll take them to the DMV to get their photo, their license, get an ID card. We'll take them to Social Security to get a Social Security card. So there's many organizations out there that are willing to reach out to these folks, give them job training skills, job interview skills, provide them clothing, and help them find jobs to turn their lives around. So we're there to do that with them also. But we're also, at the same time, we'll provide them that information and we'll help lead them down the road to success. But we're also there to tell them, if you don't want to change your ways, we're here. And we're not going to stand for you not changing your ways. And what this led to in this particular case, we targeted this individual that was on probation out of Sacramento, up north. Yeah, he was on probation there, but he found a home here in the Temple City, decided this was a great place to live. I don't blame him, this is a great city to live. I wish I could live in the city. But somehow he managed to uh, scrape a couple of nickels together and find residency here. And obviously he didn't change his way. So we did a probation check on him. And lo and behold, 
We find a work vest and a work helmet. We find Rolex watches. We find jewelry. We found cash. And he could explain why he had all his apartment. We found drugs, narcotics. We found a lot of money. A lot of, a lot of money. money. So we uh, put out a news press release, and we actually found some victims that were victims of distraction robbery. So this guy, unfortunately, sometimes people don't change their ways. You know, and we've got to make sure that if they're going to change their ways, then we have housing for them, and we'll make sure they get the housing. But again, it's not. We're not trying to be out there to depress anybody because we drop off and we, we encourage them to change their lives and we show them a way to change their ways. But they choose not to. We're going to be here. And we're not going away. Um, that kind of leaves, I don't know, probably jump around and say, do you want to hold off on that a little bit? Uh, we'll, uh, we'll probably come to that. Okay. Well, we'll get we'll get back for each important feature here. Okay. You got my soapbox. <laughs> right. As the captain mentioned, we do have our crime statistics um, up here shows the part one crimes for the five months of the first five months of this year, January through May. Um, as you can see, we have three of the totals highlighted. Those are our residential burglaries, our petty thefts, and our grand thefts autos, stolen um, vehicles. As the captain said, uh, our burglaries were increased, but that's where we have the specialized operations and to do with enforcement, saturation patrol, um, the petty thefts. Those are again crimes of opportunities. Someone leaves their window open with the iPod sitting on the front seat. Someone's going to take it. Uh, it's just it's an opportunity for them walking by. Do you mind if I try and add here a little bit? Sure. <laughs> Again, going over these crimes with Brian here, the, uh, the larceny, that's another big crime that we're experiencing, not only in Temple City, but again, not only in Temple City, but in Temple City but throughout the county. It's amazing, this day and age, and I know it's convenience. There's a lot of those mobile German mm -hmm. GPS systems that you can stick on your window, put it there, and people get so used to it, it's almost like, how do we survive without them? It's like cell phones. Everyone's got them. Everyone's got them in the car. I have them in my car. But please, when you park your car, put them away. That's a big neon sign for a suspect to break a window and go in your head. And laptops, people, they get so accustomed because it's an everyday item that we use now. It used to be an exotic tool, whatever. It was unbelievable we had laptops. Now everyone's got them. They, you use them, and you go to your coffee shop, and drink your coffee, you're playing on it. Then you just fold that, you throw the back seat, and you're off. And then you get to your friend's house, or your house, or your school, or the office, and leave it playing there. Right? And that's just a big flag. Suspects, they're not a dummy. They're walking down the street, and they're looking at empty car, empty car, empty car, GPS, and a laptop. Which window am I going to break? Am I going to do door number one, door number two, or door number three? And that's, that's let's make a deal when it's showing you the prize right in front of you. You're not taking any chance between one and two. You got to go to three. And I know I'm getting a GPS device and I'm getting a laptop. And we preach this every meeting we get to. And this is the one crime that we can impact like that. If people take their items with them, or at least put them under the seat, or put them in the trunk. And do that before you get to where you're going. Doesn't do you any good to get there and get the laptop and check it under your seat and take the GPS out. Because crooks hang out in parking lots and they watch, okay. All right, I see what you're doing. If you're a block away, take it off. Tuck it under the seat and put it in the box before you pull them where you get. Now, put it in the trunk, that's better than, because the crook's not going to want to break in the trunk as opposed to breaking the windows. It takes more time. Got to draw more attention to himself. But please, you know, like, we can eliminate that. Well, we can't eliminate it. We'll never eliminate crime completely. But we can greatly reduce that. You go to the office tomorrow for water cooler, say, you know what, the sheriff last night were talking to me, and hey, you just put your stuff away. And that's one, but you say that every time. It's kind of like telling kids now they don't do drugs. This day and age, it's amazing that any kid above the age of eight can claim that they don't know the names of drugs because it's put out there, that message out there, out there. But time and time again, those poor kids decide that uh, it's not going to happen to me, I can handle this. You know, tragic stories, but same with this here with, with property and car. You tell people time and time again, it's so easy to reduce that crime. But please, if you learn nothing else tonight, please. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, yes. you explain the part one crime, you give an example of part two crimes. Yeah. Part two crimes are going to be drinking in publics, petty um, thefts. <clears throat> 
Um, and currently, just to let you know right now, the uh, grand theft, the different be difference between petty theft and grand theft is the dollar amount. Um, and just so you know, it has been raised this year. It was only $400 in the past. As of uh, January uh, 1st, it's now $950. It's now grand theft. So it's kind of unfortunate because a lot of these criminals, you know, we used to get them repeat offenders, but now with that grant up, they said it's so high, it's a little more difficult now. So just a little side note there. Yes. So your part two crimes are driving without a license, driving on a suspended license, and drinking in public, smoking in the park, and so some of the lesser uh, serious crimes are still still a crime, but it's not as serious as your murders, your, your rapes, or burglaries. Um, Is there any difference between aggravated assault and assault? They, it all do, they have an assault category which falls out of a part two crime, which is a misdemeanor battery, like I come and I push Brian or something like that. That, that doesn't fall. Aggravated assault is if I come up and hit Brian with a bat, or if I cause some kind of injury to him, or if it's a domestic crime. If it's domestic abuse work. Not that he and I partners, but if he's one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he he, he, he hurts me. That, that goes into aggravated assault category. Thank you. Uh, Up on the screen, we have the arrest stats. Um, numbers can be deceiving. If you look at over a five month period, we have a total of 414 arrests. Um, and, and some may say that's a bad thing. Um, but depending on how you look at it, and it'll be explained right now, um, that just means that our deputies are out there doing the job. They're out there stopping people. If they write a ticket for someone that doesn't have a license, that's a misdemeanor violation, and that's technically arrest. And so that's why you have also an increase in misdemeanor violations. Uh, our arrests, 317 for the whole five month period. And so the fact that our, our numbers are up doesn't mean that our crime is really running around rampant and uh, it's a bad thing. It's actually a good thing that our deputies are out there doing their job, contacting the bad guys, taking people to jail that need to go to jail. Hey, can I add one part to that too? Mm -hmm. A big trend on that also was, I'm sorry, was, and I have to give compliments to Mr. Polito and the city staff and to the city council. Uh, we were able to obtain a uh, grant for the first time in this past year here, 2012. We uh, were able to add an extra deputy to the uh, Temple City Special Team. And that tremendously enhanced our ability to do operations and surveillances. Obviously, the more people we have to put on an operation, the more successful these operations are going to be. And it added another deputy to the streets of Temple City. So that was, I have to, and that was through the efforts of the city staff and the city council. So I have to recognize their efforts in allowing us to do that. Are these statistics for Temple City or for the area? This is Temple City specific. Yeah, and, and they're a little different than what I read off because I read off until last Sunday night, and this was until, you said May? End of May. End of May. So my numbers are a little higher than what I read off, but those numbers that were presented tonight are specific to Temple City. And the captain touched on some of these already, the crime trends in Temple City, um, some of them are the distraction burglaries we're dressing up, um, also some of the other issues that we have, um, a lot of the seniors getting burglarized or scam burglaries and so um, the neighborhoods are affected, it's not specific to one neighborhood, um, we don't have a map to show where the, the crime trends are where we have a targeted area. The Sheriff's Department does proactively monitor that and keep an eye, we have a crime, crime analyst that looks at all the crimes and can kind of, as best as they can, forecast where crimes are going to occur more and target those with our saturation operations. Um, Sergeant Brandon, it looks like he's coming up. I now. just wanted to pass this around as an example of how our crime analysis tracks our crime. If you look at this map, it's of the city of uh, that we patrol, the cities and counties, and it shows, and off to the side, you'll see it, it's broken down. Commercial burglaries, which are businesses, we know that, residentials. And it breaks it down, it has a little symbol. So if you could just take a look and pass around. Unfortunately, our crime analysis person didn't have uh, uh, the time she's been off, she's actually injured. Uh, but I just want you all to take a look at it and then we'll pass these around at some point as well, which is uh, area of watch uh, handouts. If you've been to an area watch meeting, you'll know what they are. If not, you'll, I think you'll find some good information. And so what are measures that are being implemented? Um, again, we have the saturation patrol, 
bring in additional resources that the Sheriff's Department has available, such as our Reserve Forces Bureau. We have volunteer deputies on the department that can come in and saturate and help patrol the city. Uh, some of the regional issues that are affecting Temple City is crime creeping in from other cities. Temple City doesn't have a lot of crime or residents in the city that are committing a crime. It's coming in from other areas, um, some of it from our southern border with the uh, Monty. And so it's crime coming in and we're, we're doing pretty good um, considering looking at the statistics uh, of the crime that we have. What we have in a month, some cities have in one day. Um, one of the other issues is the Department of Corrections early release program. Everybody's heard in the news the Department of Corrections are releasing prisoners and this becomes the responsibility of the Sheriff Department or the County Sheriff of those counties to manage or take in those inmates. Um, and how does this affect local law enforcement? Um, we can have Captain talk a little bit about, real quick about the the early release program, the Northern Ohio is known as Assembly Bill 109. Uh, it's a mandate for the uh, California Department of Corrections to reduce their population. Uh, with that being said, a vast majority of inmates uh, within the California penal system have been released to the probation departments of all the counties throughout California. So the probation department has responsibility monitoring and violating any of these releases, released inmates. So these are inmates that have served, uh, still sentence inmates, mind you. They have not fulfilled their complete sentence. But because the uh, <clears throat> mandate to reduce the population within the California Department of Corrections, there's a segment that's been selected to say, you know, they, they, they're trying to identify what they consider less dangerous criminals. Now, if I went to prison on a burglary charge, but my, because I violated probation by committing a burglary, but I got on probation originally because I shot and killed somebody, and I got a manslaughter charge, that's the individual that they're releasing because I'm technically in custody on a burglary charge. So because they're released as a burglar, they kind of ignore the fact that that person committed murder early in their life and their career and started off the criminal activity. So they're considered less threatening or pose less threat to society. So that individual is identified, they're able to qualify the safety one on the program, and they're released. Now, there are also releasing people who have done nothing but burglaries. Bottom line is, we're getting a lot of criminals released from the state prison, and they're being given custody of probation departments. Now, LA County Probation Department is primary responsibility for monitoring these individuals. They come out of prison, they have a meeting with the probation department, they say where they're going to live, and the probation department says, okay, we're going to these are the rules, and they also provide programs to help mentor them and help them change their lives. The Sheriff's Department is taking on the role of we're going to go out and we're going to do inspections of your houses. The probation department doesn't have the capability or the manpower to go out and do all the inspections. So they come in, they register where they're going to live. The probation department gives us the list of where the people live in. We go out and we do site visits to make sure they're not involved in criminal activity. If they are involved in criminal activity, we'll contact the probation department and say, hey, we found this person in violation of this, this, this. They'll make the decision whether they go back to jail or not. If it's a, if we go to a probation search, we find this person with guns, well, we're going to arrest them on a gun charge. If they're in possession of some kind of contraband that violates their probation, probation makes the decision whether they go back to jail or not. Either way, they're going to go back to jail into the county system. And they've got to be time in. So the county jail's population is going to swell again. And that's one thing that we're concerned on. It's not a major concern right now because we have the room in the county jails to house these folks. But they don't go back and do state time. They go do their time in county jail. And generally it's about 180 days and then it'll come back up. So we try to identify within the Temple City Station area, and that's all there, not just Temple City, and that's Rosemead, that's South Carolina, Kenworthy, Bradbury, and all the incorporated county areas. We have about 77 in the last count, I think, of these AV 109 inmates that have been released from the state prison back to us. And so we do deal, we're very diligent about making sure we contact these individuals 
you know, unfortunately, a lot of them can come back and they can get one address and they can go somewhere else and now we're not looking for them. We call those buildings a large house. And we have quite a few of those, to be honest with you, we do. But uh, of the 77 that registered in our area, we, we make sure that we introduce ourselves to them and that we keep track of them. Now it's, you know, it's, we're also trying to do other things too, but it's, uh, it's a challenge to us, but it's a challenge that we, we have a good handle on. And so it's no great fear that you should be feeling all the way to the coming back and you're just getting released. There's nothing more to turn up. Where do you get that? Such people, they, they, do they give them some identification which other people can find out? Like the scarlet letter? <laughs> <laughs> I wish it would be that easy. You know, I like your, can you go for governor, please? <laughs> the, uh, no, you, you wish it would be, but you know what? They, they, they have a right to come back to society and blend in and, and do right. You know, that's no, but if those, they don't change the ways. If they don't, you're absolutely right. If they don't change the ways. Then you know, they should have identification. I, I agree. They I agree. should pick one. But, but know that. Uh, well, now we're not talking about violent predators. We're not letting out any knowingly letting out any violent predators. But you, know, you can rest assured, if someone's in the state prison time, they've done more crimes than what they've gotten caught for. It's kind of general. I, I tend to believe that. I know there's some people out there who believe that's the only crime they ever committed. And on some cases, that is the case. But I would venture to say the vast majority of people in the state, if you find your way to state prison, you're a pretty substantial crime, especially the way the penal system. You have to be a pretty substantial crook to end up in jail. It's not just a drunk driver that ends up in jail. Yes, sir. Uh, kind of what she's saying, though, the sexual predators, you can find out on a map where they live. Do uh, prisoners that got released get to have a map? No, we don't, do, we don't release that to the public. That's we don't do that them. But, but what you're referring to is our, what we call 296 registrants, and they are have to register in Vegas law, and we do make that available to you. But that's just a safety. I mean, that's a false blanket of security, to be honest with you. Because if you don't think, for every one that we catch, there's 10 out there that haven't been caught. So please, don't just look at your neighborhood and say, okay, oh, I only have three guys in my neighborhood that i got to watch out for. If that's what you're basing your safety on, please, let me change your way of thinking right now. You have, especially if you have kids, you have to be, I'm not saying be paranoid, but be paranoid. I mean, err on the side of caution. I mean, really, I mean, those are just the known predators that we have. Those are the people that have been caught. You know, our, our sexual violent predators, we put anchor bracelets on. We have drew a track on. Right, John. I have a question in regards to this early release program. Does uh, California use pirate prisons instead of also, or no? Uh, you mean outside prisons? Yeah. No, but that is an option that the uh, LA County Sheriff Department is considering should our population rise up we are looking in the possibility of contracting with private jails and jails in other counties we have the largest the la county jail system is the largest jail system in the free world we house more inmates in the la county jail jail system not state not prison now jail is you're incarcerated there until you go to court and you're sentenced but that has now changed because now we're getting sentenced inmates housed in the county jail because they can't be housed in state prison. So at some point, if this, and I'm sure this program is gonna continue, we're gonna exceed the jail population. We're gonna to have to look at options, you know, contracting out to private jails or even jails outside of the state, but, but it, or county jails. There's a lot of county jails out there, but it has become a business. So some counties are gonna start building jails and contracting with LA County in the future to house our prisoners. But that is, a lot of states do that. A lot of states will contract with either private jails or they'll send, I know inmates from uh, like Texas, I incarcerated quite a few people in Texas. They contract with jails in Colorado, in multiple states away. It's, it's amazing. I just thought uh, Real quick, just to keep the class going, um, if there's one more question, yeah. we have a few other slides to go through, and we want to try and keep the schedule together. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on time, so go ahead. Just quick, uh, I would have a recommendation um, to help keep the state neighborhood, especially if we do so locally the way it changes. I think uh, in, in the city, the city should, uh, in monthly newsletter, the city can uh, 
was it? Can I write a letter, this letter, just, just uh, everybody needs to be writing that, but I think including the, in the um, uh, watching of the crime. As a citizen, uh, the residents, to encourage them to, um, you know, pay attention to what if sending anything going in the city, uh, you know, on their street, and they, they think it's the suspicious, uh, you know, call the show. Right. And that kind yeah. of leads into one of our later slides, our neighborhood watch program. So yeah. I'll touch a little bit more as far as what we can do to implement kind of what your idea is. It's something that we're already working on, um, but that is definitely a great idea. Um, regional issues affecting Temple City, just to wrap it up real quick. Um, XD sales and marijuana grow houses, um, you read them in the paper, you see them on the news. Grow houses are found because fires occur and they find a million dollars worth of marijuana plants in a house. And XD sales, just that's uh, not only limited to Temple City, there are some instances in Temple City, but it's a regional issue as well. And we address this by, again, having our specialized operations, our saturation enforcement, having our, our other resources, narcotics bureau, everybody, um, put those resources together and, and try and combat these issues. Um, what is the city doing to enhance Sheriff's Department services? Uh, we're working with the Sheriff's Department to shift the philosophy to a community-oriented policing. Instead of the traditional response to crimes, uh, we're going to we're shifting and having a more proactive approach to working with the community to try to prevent crime uh, and have a working relationship with the community. Uh, because of that, we overhauled our neighborhood watch program. Our previous program was uh, very ineffective. It was a block by block neighborhood watch meeting and we had limited participation, four to five residents attending each meeting. Um, now that we overhauled the neighborhood watch program, uh, you have the maps in front of you. We have four neighborhood watch areas uh, and our goal is to have one neighborhood watch meeting per month uh, in one of those areas. And we've already gone through, I think, maybe nine of the areas, and we'll be wrapping up the 12 first set of meetings um, shortly, and then we'll start it over with the first areas again. The map that you have in front of you shows the remaining meetings for this year, and then the other meetings beginning again next year are still to be determined on date, time, and location. Um, and with the Neighborhood Watch, uh, again, we're trying to get community involvement. We have the neighborhood areas, um, but we're looking for also area leaders and block captains to help facilitate that uh, communication with the residents. And so through that medium, we can also disseminate maybe a monthly newsletter through our Neighborhood Watch program that we have those individual block captains assist us or those area leaders assist us to help get that information or even produce that document. and help keep that an ongoing uh, program. And so if you are interested, uh, please contact us. Uh, Deputy Rick Adams, who's not here tonight, is the one in charge on the Sheriff's Department side. And uh, for the city side, I help run the Neighborhood Watch program as well. Um, what is the city doing to enhance services? Again, we're produced contractual service obligations. Uh, we do contract with the Sheriff's Department, so we do have certain requirements that we want to see met. And we work closely with the Sheriff's Department to ensure that uh, the residents of Temple City are receiving the service levels that they should receive. Um, we required a strategic planning for the next two years. The Sheriff's Department prepared a strategic uh, plan for law enforcement that is being implemented uh, as, long, as well as the city's strategic plan. And again, competition breeds efficiency. Uh, we want more bang for the buck, and so we want to make sure that um, we look at other avenues once a contract expires. Um, if the Sheriff's Department is going to provide us that level of service and continue providing it, uh, we'll continue to service with the Sheriff's Department. But if there's another agency that can provide that level of service, we want to make sure that Temple City gets the best service for the dollar. Um, next, we'll go into the Fire Department. The Fire Department, Temple City, is served by four stations. We have one station in Temple City. It's Station 47. It's next to City Hall. But we are also served by four stations, one in Almonte, one in Rosemead, and one in the North San Gabriel County area. Uh, they all have different areas that they serve, uh, different parts of the town. Uh, the fire department provides emergency and medical, emergency medical and fire suppression response. They could conduct business inspections, uh, looking for making sure that your fire doors are clear, you have your exit lights, um, anything that is pertaining to the fire code in the business to ensure the safety of the public. Um, the people that work there and the people that shop there. They maintain and test all fire hydrants in the city. Again, that's their apparatus to make sure that they have the equipment necessary and it's functioning properly for them to do their job. 
the city does not have direct oversight uh, of the county fire department services uh, or the sheriff's department, and this is because fire services are paid by a special tax assessment, which is on your uh, property tax bill. Um, emergency preparedness. What is emergency preparedness? How is the city prepared, and how can I be prepared? Um, emergency preparedness is ensuring that an organization or person has complied with preventative measures to contain the effects of a disastrous situation. And so it's preparing to, for disaster and making sure that you can cope with it and deal with it uh, to the best of your ability. Uh, the city, we have an emergency operation plan that drives the city response to a disaster. Uh, we recently updated our emergency operations plan. It was adopted by the city council in December of 2011. Uh, but it was approved by the state in June 2011. Our prior update to that plan was in 1996, so there was some gap in time um, when that plan was due. The EOP was developed and used during the windstorm, and it was an invaluable um, tool in our response to the windstorm. And they basically, um, EOP is like our playbook on how we're gonna respond and utilize our resources at both the local, state, and federal levels. Um, and it allows the city to request reimbursement for uh, response and recovery efforts. Um, the city takes the implementation of the plan very seriously and it's constantly working. Uh, the EOP, or the emergency operation plan, is not just a document that we create and put on the shelf and then it sit there five years collecting dust. It's a living, breathing document and it's being updated, worked, exercised um, all the time. Um, 2012, creating the continuum of responders. Um, again, we're moving forward in emergency preparedness and response. Uh, the city has created an emergency preparedness working group, which consists of the city of Temple City, the Temple City Unified School District, the Sheriff's Department, the Fire Department, City of Rosemead, American Red Cross, and we also have a clergy group that meets quarterly in the city of Temple City. Uh, we do reach out to our, our faith-based organizations, and we have a member, or we'll have a member of that group to sit on our working group so that we make sure that the entire city is covered from all facets, um, whether it's the faith-based, uh, law enforcement, fire department, and even working with other cities. What, why the city of Rosemead? City of Rosemead? How, how was that picked? Uh, I've been working with the city of Rosemead very closely already. Uh, we share a border. We have similar structures as far as the city. They have contract law enforcement, contract fire department. So gotcha. a lot of the infrastructure of the way the organizations run are similar and what they contract out. Uh -huh. And it's something that um, we're working to share resources, and especially since we share borders. Good, thanks. And we also <coughs> entered into an agreement with the American Red Cross uh, for an emergency shelter at Live Oak Park, which is a, a big step um, so that if we do have to have an evacuation, we do have the resources of the American Red Cross to provide staffing, materials, equipment, and to run that shelter. Another component of emergency preparedness and how the community can get involved is our community emergency response team. It trains residents about disaster preparedness, hazards, and basic response skills. Uh, the training is provided uh, by the fire department, sheriff's department, and the city of Temple City. It's either one entity or a combination of those. Um, CERT volunteers assisted during our windstorm event. Uh, ironically, we had a class graduate two weeks prior to the windstorm, and we utilized uh, that graduating class uh, to help us with information dissemination, handing out water bottles, and some minor traffic or crowd control points. And CERT trained residents can join Temple City CERT program. We're developing a program where Temple City will have a team of CERT members that will train regularly, uh, whether it's a quarterly training, monthly training, and will be involved in Temple City's response plan and uh, joining that team, uh, you'll be a, a city disaster service worker, so you'll be able to assist us in being an invaluable asset to the city. Here's some pictures of our recent CERT class that we just uh, graduated. This was um, a couple of our members. Uh, and again, you can see that the hands-on fire suppression, there's uh, nine modules that they go through, and we don't have time to go through that, but. If you're interested in it, feel free to contact me and I'll be more than happy to, to sit with you and provide you information about the program in more detail. Um, lessons learned from the windstorm. One is invest in a generator. You know that power is going to go out, don't know when it's going to come back up. And so a lot of people didn't have generators and they felt the pain on that. And Home Depot ran out of them as soon as everybody went to get them. And so you want to invest in that beforehand, having that tool available to you. 
Um, have personal supplies of non-perishable food and water. Uh, again, power going out, your refrigerator is not going to be ready, you're going to have food that's going to go bad. You want to make sure you have food available that's not perishable that you don't have to refrigerate and <coughs> available for your use. And again, making sure that you have water um, enough to last you uh, through the event. Um, the ideal situation is you want to have one gallon of water per person for three days. So one gallon per day per person. Um, know what your insurance policy is and what it covers. Uh, some windstorm damage may have been covered by insurance on some properties, but it may have not been covered by others. And so you want to know what your insurance policies cover for both your house and automobile. Uh, make sure that it's something that you're, you're comfortable with. And if it isn't, talk to your insurance agent to see what other policies are out there available for you. Um, and it may cover temporary housing in some cases? Yes, it, it may cover temporary housing where if you're all put out and can't get into your house because of the lack of power, your insurance may cover that and put you up in a hotel so that you're at least a little bit more comfortable than sitting in the dark. Um, consider a hardwired phone line, a landline. Uh, most people nowadays only have cell phone services. Um, with the windstorm, you can charge your phone. Um, some of the cell towers may have gone out so you don't have the ability to charge and use your cell phone and the communication lines weren't available um, to some of those residents. So having a hard line um, will provide that because those do not rely on power to service. Now, if you do have a hard line, make sure you don't have a um, cordless phone because again, that takes power to operate. So have a hardwired phone. You wanna, you wanna mention they signing up for CTY? Yeah. And most of you may already receive the phone calls on our mass notification system. If you do not, you can opt in and sign up for that. That is, again, a way that we get that information out there to the residents uh, for special events, for upcoming events, um, emergency plans, road closures, anything that is pertinent that we need to get out to the community. That is uh, one of our big ways that we use that. And so, so what do you have to do? You can go on the city's website, and there's a, a link to sign up. Um, you may already be part of the system. If not, you can go and edit your information and add your cell phone number as your primary number, include an email. Um, you can also post to Facebook, um, send out a Twitter message or a text message through this whole program. So I want to make sure that you sign up for that. And then last, have emergency phone numbers present, um, established. You want to make sure you have contact numbers for City Hall if there's emergencies, the fire department, sheriff's department, and most importantly, your personal contacts to um, your family members and friends and emergency management, we want to make sure that you have an out-of-state contact. And so if you have someone in Temple City that uses the emergency contact and they're affected as well, that's not going to do any good. Even into Rosemead, you want to have some outs outside of the immediate area contact, whether it's in Northern California or even in another state, and establish that contact. How can we get involved? Um, let's work together, stay alert, and take action. On August 8th, we're having our National Night Out event at uh, Temple City Park. It begins at 6.30 p.m. Come on out and enjoy um, National Night Out. We'll have some law enforcement uh, booths set up. We'll have the Mom Squad, I think, will be there. Uh, the Mom Squad or Squad uh, Bureau or uh, Special Enforcement Bureau, they call it. It's a squad team, and uh, we'll have recruitment out there. So if you know anybody who's interested in law enforcement, please uh, talk to them. And so coming out, and you'll see some of these specialized units that we're talking about tonight. Attend CERT training and join the team. Again, if you want more details, I'll be more than happy to speak one-on-one -on -one with you and give you those details and give you more information about the program. Participate in Neighborhood Watch. Um, if you have not gone to one of our Neighborhood Watch meetings in your area, it may be coming soon. Uh, we do have one tomorrow night in Area 4. And so if you look on your maps, it's the light blue area. It's the area is bound by Las Tunas on the north, Encinita on the east, the railroad tracks on the south, and Rosemead Boulevard on the west. Back to the National Night Out on August 8th. That's also, that's a Wednesday when there's a the concert. That'll be a concert as well. Like, is it just prior to the concert or is it part of the concert? Is it, is it, is it, is it, it, it starts prior to the concert, mm -hmm. but it'll continue through the concert. Like it starts at, I think, 6 or 6.30 okay. and ends at 9. No, they're on Temple City Park, both the concert and National Night Out. Um, sign up for a ride along with the Sheriff's Department. The Sheriff's Department does have a ride along program. Um, you'll have to fill out a waiver, and uh, the captain could uh, provide more information on that later if anybody's interested. 
um, learn more at the Sheriff's Community Academy. As the captain said, they also offer an academy, a six-week academy, uh, that starts a little bit different, but you're more than welcome to attend that and learn more information. And if you have any other questions, you can give us a call. Um, Deputy Rick Adams, again, he manages the Neighborhood Watch Program. Um, and his phone number is up there. And you can contact myself um, and at City Hall. Yeah, and last time I participated in the CERT and I signed up for that right along with the sheriff. It was, it was very quick, real, and fun. Yes. <laughs> then he, he stopped uh, some parole. You know, then, uh, <laughs> Very live experience. Very live TV show. Yeah. In the day, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and it, our, our next Citizens Academy is in two weeks on August 2nd at 7 p.m. And this will be at Live Oak Park Community Center. <coughs> um, and again, uh, start sending your photos uh, of the academies to Brian Haworth. Uh, most of you should already have his email address. And that concludes our presentation tonight. Um, our, our next activity is we're going to go on a tour of the station. We're going to, as it allows, um, try and get you guys into the jail to see where the booking area, look at all that. Um, the dispatch center, uh, so you can see how calls are received, how they're dispatched out, both regular routine calls and 911 calls. Uh, we'll also show you the supervisor, the sergeant's uh, call. Uh, it has all the equipment necessary. It's a, basically a mobile command post that, if it's available. We'll show you that in the parking lot, and we'll also show you in the lobby there's a visiting booth uh, that if an inmate has a visitor um, through a video camera system, they can visit that inmate. And then as time allows, uh, we may also go up and show you the detective bureau um, where all the detectives operate out of. So, uh, a question, you know, please. Uh, does citizens arrest cold water here in the state? Citizens arrest. Absolutely. Depending on what the time is, yes. Um, there's going to be times where we'll, we'll get to the scene and Um, and depending on what the crime is, we'll explain the ramifications of both the arrest the citizen wants to make the arrest and makes the arrest and then the uh, lack of the other suspect. And when you do make a citizen's arrest, it's a, it's a responsibility for the arrest is on the citizen. That's what we call a citizen's arrest. We have you sign a piece of paperwork and you'll be responsible for going to court and pressing charges. And that's done for adults, it's done for misdemeanor not committed non presence. If you're an adult and you commit a misdemeanor absent <coughs> misdemeanors related to firearms or misdemeanors or related to DUI, if, you, if you're drunk and you crash a car and you run away, we can still come down, track you down, and arrest you because of, because of the ball of alcohol and the traffic accident. Or if you have a gun, it's a misdemeanor offense, we can still make that arrest even though it wasn't in our presence. If you tell me he had a gun, I can go arrest him if you told me he had a gun because it was firearm involved. But if you punched him and I didn't see it, it's only a minor injury, it's not an aggravated assault, it should be just a regular assault, you could press, make assistance to the rest. You'd have to do that because I didn't witness it. So we default to you to make assistance to the rest. So yeah, they, they are valid. They, we still do it all the time. But it just it's your responsibility to sign. You're going to sign the booking slip and you're going to sign what we call a probable cause declaration to make the arrest. Because you're the one that was the victim when you witnessed it. Thank you. You have to just a uh, quick question for uh, yes. one minute. Uh, to address the, uh, uh, the problem of not being able to recharge the cell phone. Yes. I'm thinking of uh, when we use a car battery. I mean, you just connect with the voltage adapter. You go down from 12 volts to 5 volts. Mm -hmm. and then, we, because you can drive to get the gas from other I mean, miles away, so why don't we try that? Uh, you know. I'm sure there's other ways out there. Some people may not have the skills or the technical knowledge to do something like that. Um, and if we want to make sure part of the program is to try and have the resident be self-sufficient, self-sustaining. In the event of a disaster, a, a big disaster such as an earthquake, uh, the city, the sheriff's department, the fire department, the state aren't going to have necessarily all the resources to respond to everybody. And so that's what the CERT program encourages a resident to be self-sustaining and self-sufficient. Take care of yourself. Um, once you take care of yourself and your family, take care of your neighborhood, and then you can become uh, a bigger asset to the city and help us go take care of these other residents and neighbors that don't have that training or knowledge. Question. 
Uh, I see people using the driving recorder in the car. The driving recorder? Right, driving recorder. Yeah, you know, those videotapes that, that you put underneath your windshield. Oh, they're the video cameras so they're yeah. recording? Right. Would you guys that? Is it legal? Um, you know, it's funny you brought that because I saw a kid on a motorcycle had a camera not there on tell And in that situation, it's not illegal because it's not, it's not obstructing the view. Okay. Anything that's hanging in your windshield is obstructing your view to be cited for. Okay. Even if stuff's hanging from your rear view mirror, right? Yeah. A lot of people, people will hang the craziest things from your rear view mirror. If it obstructs your view outside through the windshield, uh -huh. then we can't cite for it. Yes. Well, what about, I, I just wanted it on the top of my dashboard. If it's obstructing your view to the dashboard, then yes. Yeah. And you keep a coffee mug up, so you keep the big, that could be a because you, it seems minimal when you're looking at it from far, but if it's up close, that can block quite a bit. It's like your hand here, it doesn't block much of my vision. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But here, I can block off half this room. Right. So depending upon, and we're going to use common sense. But yeah, yeah. If you have a big movie camera up in your windshield, you have a <laughs> But this kid here the other night, I was pulling right out of here going home. And I was on top of almost two minutes there. George was just keep going next to me on the motorcycle at a camera. I can only imagine he's probably driving like a crazy man on the freeway trying to get a good video. Okay. So if, I don't know how long I have to do this. Oh, well, real quick, I just wanted them to all look at Has anybody, just a show of hands, can you just, who's attended one of our area wide meetings so far? Okay. Uh, what do you guys think, real quick, just in a nutshell, well, just talk about your partial yeah, right. yeah, It's good that you get to uh, uh, really get together and uh, be aware of what's going on in the neighborhood. Exactly. It's very good. It's kind of along the lines. I wish it can be getting bigger. And, so you can maybe want to be very aware of it. A lot of good information. We do uh, uh, police work, too. So good. Uh, what we need you to do, because you're right, we, we, we're, we're amazed and we really, Temple City, I have to take my hats off to Temple City residents. We can well, tomorrow night, I'm expecting upwards of 80 people. That's pretty much been the average lately. Good crowds on Friday night, and that's a compliment to the city. it's free dinner. Yeah. yeah. So I was going to say, I was going to ask what you thought about the dinner, but you gave it away. Provide dinner and child care. So if you have kids, come on out and watch your child. That would have been more. But even with that, with that, we know in those big area watches, 80 people is still only a fraction who lives there. So we need whoever attends those meetings, go and be an ambassador for us. Tell them how good and informational those meetings are. Spread the word that we give you. Go out there and tell them about the construction burglary. Go out there and tell them about leaving stuff in the vehicle. But encourage them to come to the next meetings because next next year we go around this, we got 80 people. I want to see 160. I want to see 200 people. And eventually we get this. And I know we'll never get everybody because people work and sick and vacation and whatnot. Tomorrow night is at the first Lutheran Church. Okay. Okay. 9123 Broadway. It's on it's area four. Sergeant, as a business owner, I think that the business watch is really lacking because I don't know what the answer is to get these people out because, I mean, it can only hurt them if they don't have the information. So, I mean, we have a couple hundred businesses on Lost Tunis. Why do we only get, you know, six or eight or whatever it is show up? I mean, it's terrible. Absolutely, I agree. Yeah. And maybe the business community has a better suggestion we're open to because the deputies have walked and handed walked into every business right. and handed them. I think yeah. they, they pretty much have rely on police work. So that's, that's what it used to be. So yeah. we need to change the Yeah, I was going to say, that's true. Uh, we've heard that, and that is a great thing. Uh, real quick, I gave you, I handed you an area watch uh, packet, and I just wanted you to briefly go through it. But this is basically what we discuss. Uh, my guy, Rick Adams, and tomorrow will be uh, Deputy Jose Lopez, who, well, another story, but it'll be, uh, he's going to do us a service. He's actually not on the team anymore because uh, the contract ran out, but he is going to fulfill his obligation and then do the uh, area watch meeting tomorrow. Uh, anyway, moving along with that, if you can look through it once again, it does break down the areas. It shows you that map that, uh, I, that we uh, passed around about the residential burglaries, the vehicle burglaries. Once again, that is our number one crime in the area. That crime occurs in every nice community, I'm gonna tell you right now, where people work, there are burglaries, okay? It's simple as that. You go to work, thieves know that, they go in houses if they're looking for opportunity. 
Uh, believe it or not, we're still finding uh, bedroom windows open a lot at residents. Uh, like the captain said, I'll walk around, I'll take a look. You know, where is the opportunity? Oh, let's see, window open, window closed. I mean, these guys, you know, it's their job. Like, we all go to work every day. These guys prey on people and, you know, look for victims, look for the easy targets. And without you guys, just like our strategic plan and our future is, without you, we really, it's like a needle in a haystack for us to really find the true criminals out here. I mean, we would literally have to set a police unit up at every block to find a criminal. You know, and this is a great area. It really is. Trust me. I mean, crime-wise, this is one heck of an area. We want to keep it that way. We want to keep the crime down. We want to keep. We want you to feel safe in this community. That's what our whole goal and obligation is in our service to you. Okay, and I would want that for any community. But you guys are our city. You're my city. I'm your liaison sergeant. That is truly what I want. Our numbers are right here, easily accessible to you. My guys are very good. They'll get back to you. Sometimes we're very busy. We're doing operation search warrants. We're doing uh, parole compliance checks. We're doing something every week, and a lot of times things are just thrown on us. Hey, go look at this. Go do this. Go do that. But we are here for you. We will get to it. Sometimes we take a little while, but we will get to it. We will call you back. We will email you back. My guys are very good about that. So I can't emphasize enough. We want to partner with you. We want you to know that we're there for you. We want to build that bond with you guys to where you can trust us. Some people don't know law enforcement officers on a personal level. And uh, I was talking to a gentleman yesterday. Uh, perfect example. He's an older gentleman. Uh, read the paper all the time. Uh, sees it one-sided. He's been cited before. He sees us maybe rolling through three somewhere. He doesn't necessarily know why or like it. And I explained to him some of the reasons why we do the things we do. By the end of that conversation, we, we seem to hit it off pretty well. But if you go by just the news, uh, obviously nobody wants to get a ticket. I've got them. I don't like getting them. Uh, but trust me, we're just like you. We're average, everyday people. We're just trying to do our job, which is to keep this community safe and to keep your homes and all your property safe. That's our whole goal. Uh, but anyway, these are the things we talk about. We do have food at those meetings. I can't emphasize enough. Please attend. Tell your, you know, if you can't, have maybe a family member represent or, you know, let your neighbors know or whatever. But I'm telling you, I, I assure you, you will not, and you can leave any time. You're not held there the whole two hours. You come in, you leave when you choose to. Yes. What if you're not that, in that area? Like uh, it's coming to your area. Uh, and, oh, it has. Well, come on tomorrow. Come on, come on tomorrow. And that, that's a very good point right there. Come on down. Uh, once again, the city, city manager, city council, they provide food. They, you know, we have staff there to watch the kids. Uh, give them a movie, or I'm sorry, what's that? Provide a movie, and it's just, it's really a great thing. It, it really is. I wish they had it in a mic. So, so we can get on the tour of the station, and we can hold the questions. So after, if any questions after, we can ask. Definitely out to that. Can we leave our books here? Yes, you leave your books here. Stay in their dress suit. Okay. So they get to keep everything. The only thing that we take from them at the time of booking is their shoes, but when they go to court or if they bailed out, we give it back at that well, time. The one that stay here for a long time, what they Well, the most that somebody could stay here is technically um, 48 hours, give or take, you know, um, and that's business hours, okay? If it's a weekend or a holiday, of course it's longer, but because of the small number of inmates that we could keep here, they normally don't stay here very long. We normally have to send people to county, being uh, Men's Central Jail or CRDF, which is in Linwood for the females. And just about every weekend, we send some people downtown just to allow us the space to book more people and for the new arrests. And here, only people come from Temple City or Almonte and all that? Oh, no, all our um, holy area. Yes, all our area. Duarte, yes. And more San than 26, let's say 24 plus 2 occupancy, then what do you do with the rest? Um, of we could still, if it's a business day, let's say it's tonight, we end up with 26, 27. They're gonna, there's going to be court line in the morning, so we would keep them. Unless there's somebody who's like a medical or for some reason they can't stay here, then we would special transport them downtown or wherever they need to go. Just throughout the whole county, so. 
we're lucky to have this lieutenant, excellent man. Oh, and, well, real quick, and that sergeant is also an excellent young man. You owe me uh, 20 bucks, Mike. <laughs> like that pop up. So, like this one right here uh, says 415 FC. That's a disturbance, 415 and FC's firecracker. Someone's lighting off fireworks. And, and it's telling what unit's assigned. See there. Yep, what unit's assigned, uh, where it is. See, we go, we get the call, you yeah. see that? So we'll go, <laughs> so I can kind of keep track of what all the units are doing. So all these calls will oh, come these out. these are touch screens. Yeah, these are touch screens. Nice. So, uh, <laughs> and then down the side here, you know, we have vehicle license plates, we just uh, wanted persons, uh, your driver's license info, that sort of stuff. We can all run it from here. It shows up on our computer kind of normal stuff. The nice thing about the, now we have computer-based systems, if you will, is some additional functions like we now have built-in mapping software and GPS. Cool. So um, this is you know like some sort of Garmin or any of that kind of stuff. And the way it works um, with some additions, for instance, um, this is me right here in the crosshairs. Right here is 50 Sam. There's Lost Tunis, and this is Rosie right here. There's another, and it shows me all the other vehicles that are equipped with this computer system where they are. So there's one park right here in the lot. Oops, it's a touch screen. Zoomed in. There we, go. we just got it, so we're all trying to learn. Yeah. <laughs> Some faster and slower than others. Me, uh, I would have no idea what's here, going on here. So very good at it. it does. It is. It also it has uh, satellite imagery, so I can change it to a satellite overhead, which is great when we go to a place we want to see what's what's inside the yard. Um, it has the ability to when they, I get dispatched a call, I can just simply have it give me a route from where I am to the call, which is great because. I've been to this station for a year and I still don't weigh around. We do learn when we go out in the field. So, again, I want to tell everybody thank you for coming out. Um, hope you guys had a good time, learned a lot of information. Um, again, if any questions on anything that you saw today, feel free to contact Sergeant Miranda or any of the deputies listed on that handout that he gave. Or you can contact me and we can put you in touch with that. And so, if anybody else wants to stay around and see the bulletproof vest, you're more than welcome to. If anybody else is ready to leave, we'll go ahead and um, walk you guys out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.